Here is the mayor of Boston, Michelle Wu. Thank you very much for joining us Good again Good to see today. you, Mayor Wu. How are you? Thank you for She's not even ready. putting her things down. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Well, these are your things. Oh, I you're brought, incredible. So oh, my goodness. I could well, do that later. Can I tell you, by the way, we have some things for you, not because we got them, but because two chefs were here, Joey yes. Adams and Tracy <laughs> Chang. So we're going to share. By the way, if you want to speak to the mayor, she'll hear, she's here for the rest of the show, 15 minutes. You can reach her by text or phone at 877-301-8970. Or if you're at the library, if you walk over to Hannah, hello, Hannah, there would be Hannah, our coworker, and say, I'd like to ask the mayor a question. There's a fairly good shot. You'll get to ask the mayor a question face to face. Mayor Wu, it's good to see you. Thanks nice for being you. here. Yeah, Thank you. And, and Mayor Wu, I think you just came from something involving the Franklin Cummings Tech School. This we being... shoveled some dirt for yeah. the official groundbreaking. Tell what people is it? about that. Yeah, so, I mean, this is a several hundred year institution that was founded with a donation from Benjamin Franklin himself to ensure that there would be training facilities for working people for all backgrounds and the kind of apprenticeship and vocational education that he had. And um, they had been in um, Bay Village and uh, now they are, they needed more space, they needed um, more uh, modernized, um, training equipment and facilities, and so they are building a brand new facility right in Nubian Square. Nice. Um, and it's going to be fantastic. Well, you know, that sounds sort of analogous to uh, a, uh, an expansion that didn't go quite so well. The O'Brien moved to West Roxbury. I think people know you basically said we're not going to go ahead with this thing, in great part because of community concern, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. What I'm interested, how hard is that for you to have to rescind something that you believed in in the face of public opposition. That's got to be tough, is it? Well, I mean, th that's the whole point of community process is to hear and vet and bring in all different perspectives. Um, you know, this was, we had found an opportunity that in the bigger picture, because Madison Park, which, is, which currently shares the same campus as the O'Brien School mm -hmm. um, and is our only vocational technical high school, because we knew that Madison Park needed and should be prioritize for major renovations and uh, and at that point we had planned a major expansion. Um, for years and years, the O'Brien School had been promised they would get their own building anyway. They were not in initially intended to share that same campus. They had been displaced from their former building and promised one day that they would get their own space. So there was a chance to um, expand the O'Brien and also tack on in some ways, uh, find a way to accelerate the reconstruction and renovation process for a new O'Brien building because we have such a great footprint in West mm -hmm. Roxbury. But we heard loud and clear from community members that there wasn't consensus and understanding the big picture of why a move was necessary or should happen and um, the transportation issues in West Roxbury we had not solved in the first presentation. It's very, you know, very different geographic location. Now, many months later, we have a commitment from the MBTA to build mm -hmm. a commuter rail stop there. But I think there were you know, definitely a lot of lessons learned there. Madison Park will continue in, in its renovation. The O'Brien will stay where they are. And in some ways, this is both the silver lining but also a sad fact of the big picture is that we have so many different schools, 100 buildings that are in need of major renovation. So because the O'Brien isn't moving doesn't mean we're now falling back on our agenda it's just a different school out of the hundred that will be moving it for now. What are the lessons? What are a couple of the lessons learned for you personally? I think we are used to in Boston hearing things that have been presented in a one-off case, you know, case by case scenario with lots of uh, broken promises, with lots of um, ideas and, and commitments made that eventually weren't kept and that means that each conversation now comes with a lot of context and a, a need to really build trust as the first step. In my mind, initially, you know, I'm new in this, was new in this role, realizing that four years is a, a short time for a, a major construction project, so we needed to get going as quickly as possible, and let's make a decision with a proposal on the table, which could accelerate the conversation. But in some ways, it probably is best in a city like Boston to connect the dots across the entire district and start without any proposals on the table, just to start from what do we want to see with this West Roxbury site all on its own? What do we want to see for the O'Brien or English High or each of our high schools all on our own? And then helping kind of some of those um, 
consistent themes fit together with our long-term facilities plan. One last question about that, but before, let me just say again, the number is 877-301-8970 to call or text the mayor. Based on what you learned from the, well, two questions. One, the original one, how hard was it for you personally to reverse your own recommendation? And two, based on what you learned, if you had done it differently based on those things, do you think you could have prevailed here? Um, well, okay, so how hard was that? I mean, the West Roxbury site is, it's the dream location for a large high school. It has every imaginable athletic facilities already there, ready to go. It's in the middle of conservation and green space. Uh, we figured out how to work with the MBTA to make a major investment in public transportation that would be reliable anyway. So I still believe that we need an education use there. There have been all sorts of ideas floated for that space in the past, but we need our school system to have every possible resource, and there is no other site like that with the space mm -hmm. available to build something remarkable out. Like a, you know, there are lots of families that I talk to in the course of this process who are either spending their hard-earned dollars on their child's education because they aren't sure that the options in front of them in the public district are the, the best that they could find and they have decided to sacrifice and pay for education or others who are getting on a bus or going far away through the METCO program or other ways that they are leaving their home neighborhoods and, and district in order to, try, again, try to find an option that they believe is the best investment. If you go and look at these suburban schools and some of the places where our young people are already traveling great distances to go to, it is this kind of all-inclusive campus feel for a high school. It has a space for every possible activity that you'd want, every kind of educational opportunity. We have that in a location, and we just need to, we're not sure exactly what school could fit there or what combination of schools, but that's something I'm not giving up on. And then in terms of the O'Brien, I mean, they have been promised a building for several decades at mm -hmm. this point, and so um, I think it's hard to have long, long-term conversations in a district that is so used to the push and pull of a shrinking pie and having to really fight just to maintain your own baseline level of resources. And so um, we're trying our best now to get information out there so that everyone can see on their own with full transparency, what are the trade-offs, what are the needs? You know, the O'Brien School actually in the list of all of our high schools where we've now developed a, a numeric uh, criteria to understand how all the facilities needs fit together, they are ranked 17th out of uh, 35 buildings that different high schools are in. And so in fact, there are a lot of high schools that are in rougher shape than, than that particular school. So now that everything's going back in the pot, we're gonna have um, the bigger picture conversations about how to really start with those areas that need it the absolute most. Um, and it will take longer than I would like to get through the entire district, but we'll keep trying to find creative solutions to accelerate you that. You seem to be saying this was the right solution, you just didn't sell it properly. Is that quickly, is that a fair summary? I think we're not there yet as a city in having the same shared um, understanding of and acceptance of the facts, right? I've seen the data for where students live. We looked at not just where our high schoolers who are in BPS live right now and how they're getting bussed all around and a lot of them have a very long transportation journey even to get to school, but we looked at where our kindergartners currently live because these are really the high schoolers we're planning uh -huh. for by the time these buildings are built. And uh, we looked at the students and families who are not choosing BPS right now and there's a gigantic hole. There is no high school, in Boston Public High School, in the West Roxbury, mm -hmm. Roslindale area at all, whereas some of the much smaller neighborhoods like Charlestown and other places, or Roxbury has three or four high schools, depending on how you kind of count the boundaries. And so, you know, there, there are some bigger picture reasons, but we often have a conversation and it's so focused on the here and now and mm -hmm. a small community and we need to do a better job of laying the foundation to think bigger picture and holistically. Uh, to get to Mayor Wu, 877-301-8970. You know, one more thing uh, before we uh, get to the calls and the text. Um, you may have to help me out on this, Jim, because I uh, can't find the story, but basically there was this uh, report this morning that talked about how I think about 25% of young people in their 20s in Boston want to leave greater Boston because they can't afford a house. 
Uh, they can't afford a job to pay him enough money to pay the rent. She isn't working. Uh, Particularly LGBTQ people and young black and women. And young black women, that, that, that's correct. Tell me who did the study, though. That's what I don't have I don't in have it in front of me at the moment. Well, in any case, sure it was really does. frightening because it's, it's, it is a, a dilemma, and I'm afraid that by the time we do have enough housing, all these, all these talented people are going to go to Baltimore or Cleveland or something, God forbid, but you know that at least they can afford a place to live there. What do you, what do you make of that? There is so much going for us in Boston. We, we have, in some ways, that thing that you can't just get out of thin air, which is a strong community and the appeal of living in a place that, that really can feel like home. It has all the elements of being walkable and welcoming and diverse and historic and, and beautiful and clean and safe. Um, we really need to just get the basics right so that everyone who wants to live in Boston actually can. There are a lot of places right now that are struggling to become the place that people want to go to, yeah. but we have the opposite problem where people want to be here, but then they, they can't make it past the hurdles of affordability and all the other pieces to fit your life together. It's housing, it's childcare costs, it's the transportation system, it's the quality and um, kind of guarantee of quality public education across the entire district, not just in lots of bright spots here and there. So those are, those are the pieces that we're focused on, and we are seeing forward movement in a lot of them, but um, we can't keep up fast enough with how quickly the kind of knowledge and innovation economy is shifting. We are um, oftentimes digging out from decades and decades of underinvestment on these major infrastructure issues, whether it's housing that wasn't built over many decades and now we're very far below the number that we need to meet demand or the public transportation system or even our school building facilities that we are really looking at an entire district of multiple decades, I mean, you know, nearly a century in some cases of, of needing to catch up on. Let's go to Susan and Clinton. You're on with the mayor of the city of Boston, Michelle Wu. Hi, Susan. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Thanks. Um, I'm calling for a friend of mine who uh, needs to bring his daughter to Mass General Bowden Square office and needs a handicapped parking spot. At least two handicapped parking spots have been removed for the bike lane. The handicapped spots that have been removed are on Cambridge Street, westbound between Sudbury Street and New Sheridan Street. Did I say that properly? Um, it would, um, they really would like to have those spots back because he leaves from another town and has to drive around until he can get a spot close enough. And sometimes he just needs to drop his daughter off and just attend the, um, the meeting through his phone because he can't find a uh, spot close enough. Let's hear what the mayor has to say, Susan. Thank you um, for, for highlighting this. And um, on behalf of uh, someone you care about, I, I know those um, conversations are really hard when, again, we have the, the need and the desire to be involved, to tap into the incredible resources, for example, in this case, in, in that area, whether it's healthcare related or, or um, kind of something related to economic opportunities, but then there is, there is a, an infrastructure barrier here. Um, I, I'm not familiar entirely with the um, trade-offs here of whether there were roadway decisions that were made that, that gave up spots or if they were relocated to somewhere else. Uh, I know when we talk about losing parking, that is often a very, very difficult, um, you know, we, we try to, again, if it's a city project, we try to measure very carefully to understand the exact impact that that would have and how possible to preserve as much as possible. Um, but then when it comes to accessible parking spaces, that, that is a priority. So I will try to find out more if maybe my hope is that there might have been more created somewhere uh, nearby or in the area to make up for that, but I will look into it. Susan, don't hang up. If you, is it okay with you, uh, Mayor Wu? If she stays on the line, we get your contact information. Someone from the mayor's office will uh, let you know what's up there. Susan, thank you for the call. I believe we have Everett at the Boston Public Library microphone with a question about zoning reform. Is Everett there? Where's Everett? Yep. Where'd he go? Oh, there he is. Hi, hey, Everett. Everett. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm wondering about how the process of uh, Boston redoing its zoning laws is going. I'm particularly curious on the role of single family homes in Boston, because I know across the country, some cities are questioning the role of the housing type. Thank you. Great. Ah, 
This is my this made my day. A question on zoning. Oh, this is the Can't best. beat zoning, I always say. <laughs> no, that's so hard to get people interested about zoning, and it is the most important thing that we could be working on. It it literally affects every other issue around how our city fits together. Everything that we were just discussing about what makes a community livable is defined by the rules that set how our neighborhoods and communities grow and what the baseline requirements are. So uh, we are embarking on the first ever citywide major rezoning effort since 1965. Uh, we are starting with our squares and streets approach, which will focus on um, more manageable, smaller corridors in commercial business districts in our neighborhoods as a place to build that muscle, uh, really start shifting our zoning code towards uh, from height-based and, and FAR-based to form-based zoning, which is much more about capturing the shapes and the design and what really makes a neighborhood feel unique and, and maintain its character. Um, and so that is going to be the focus that Roslindale and Hyde Park are two of the first communities in that process of a six to nine month community planning process that will end up changing the zoning code and we will rotate around the city until we can kind of cover citywide. Um, in terms of housing in particular and single family housing, that won't apply so much right now in this first phase because uh, these tend to be more multi-use districts anyway and we're looking to um, increase density where it makes sense and add more housing anywhere possible. Um, but uh, there have been lots of conversations about whether an affordable housing overlay uh, to the zoning code or um, identifying places where some, some of those changes might make sense. We try to start with the places where we get the most bang for the buck in terms of density that um, already kind of fits in. In a lot of places in Boston, you'll see the existing housing stock is already of a higher density than the zoning code currently allows because everything has gone through appeals and variances and um, that is that issue is certainly in the conversation for when we expand to more residential areas as well. By the way, that was the biggest smile I've seen on your face in months <laughs> whenever it asked the zoning question. Okay. Can I ask another kid's question? Uh, kids, because we were talking about schools a minute ago. We have celebrated with you this BPS Sundays thing. People know it is the museum access for kids in the Boston Public Schools. First two Sundays of the month. I think it's a seven-month pilot. I may be off a little. That's right. For Boston Public Schools, you can bring three people with you. You have, uh, uh, there have been suggestions by members of the city council and others that uh, kids in the city who go to parochial schools, METCO kids, private school kids, where the demographics are not terribly different, should be included. I believe your response is during the pilot, we're going to stay with what we have and then judge it and decide in the future. Go back to the beginning. Why did you decide not to include all school age kids in the program at, when it started? Yeah, I mean, believe me, if I could wave a magic wand and in my role make it so that museums were free for everyone and they could still financially support themselves that is that is my dream and um definitely what i think uh again a type of critical infrastructure that makes communities as special as they are um, there is a reason why we have never had a program like this before in boston it is very hard to coordinate uh six different institutions all wildly different in their physical uh, space constraints in their revenue mm -hmm. models, in their um, timing and the programs and, and how they interact, the age range that, that tends to frequent those institutions. And so um, our goal was, again, to get something started so we could learn and think about how to make it permanent. Um, it took a year to get a negotiation with all of those institutions to a place where people were, uh, those groups were on the same page because they are they are struggling right now coming out of the pandemic, which was possibly the most disruptive and financially uh, difficult time for institutions that had to be shut down entirely to tourism and, and visitors. They are still making their way out of that financial hit. Um, and so to then say, well, we're gonna try to <laughs> send more people in who will not add at all to the finances, it was a really big leap of faith for those museums and cultural institutions. Now, what the key kind of argument here that the city was making and that we ultimately were able to come to alignment on is that this was not so much about taking away the monthly memberships to, from people who are paying to go to those museums already, but tapping into a community instead of potential visitors who have not been showing mm -hmm. up at all and, and are not 
on, you know, not losing revenue uh, because we're actually bringing an entirely new audience in. And that, that question of if it is free, who will come? How often will they come? How will they make decisions? Um, how do we ensure that this actually accomplishes the goal that's goals that we set out? That could only happen from starting smaller first and having the connections to that community to really understand why people are making the decisions that they're making. So here's what we're measuring. And so far, we've been collecting a lot of this data. Um, who's going? How did they find out about it? Whether it's their first time at these institutions, who they're bringing with them. And what we saw is that, or what we've seen so far, uh, I was just at the Children's Museum on Sunday for this last weekend with, with my kids, and um, there wasn't that much for me to do because they were just wanted to climb up and down in the structure the whole time <laughs> and I can't fit in there. So um, I got to hear from a lot of families who were coming by. And um, a lot of BPS families told me anecdotally that it was their first time there. And then the museum team, um, the president, um, Carol Chernow, and her team said that their data shows that 45% so far of the uh, BPS families who are coming have said it is their very first time at the museum. So half of the now several thousand uh, visitors lived in Boston, had never been to the Boston Children's Museum before. Wow. Now, why can't we expand it right away? Um, one, opening it up all the way, I think, introduces the level of unpredictability for these institutions. The aquarium, especially with tighter quarters, they already are worried about whether we're going to reach that capacity limit where they're going to have to turn away paying customers and visitors at the door because of the commitments to BPS. And so we want to watch that very carefully. The attendance has grown every single weekend. The other factor is that we believe that a big part of the reason why families are showing up who've never come before, a lot of this is the financial, uh, taking down the financial barrier, and a lot of it is an information barrier. So now that we're able to email, call, put out information through the ways that schools communicate with their students, we can reach every single family and we know how they're finding out about it. We don't have that mechanism to communicate with all the students and families in the other um, kind of communities that we're talking about here. This was the biggest bang for the buck uh, with one leader in Superintendent Mary Skipper and 43, 45,000 students and their families. When we're talking about even charter schools, it's, I mean, the level of complexity that introduces to bring in so many different partners to coordinate, it, it was just beyond the scope of but what we But is that the ultimate goal? Is the ultimate goal post-pilot, assuming it's judged well, to do that kind of expansion? Yeah, I think the goal is to understand how this um, affects and impacts, or how it sits differently for each institution uh -huh. in terms of their exact financial um, needs to meet the demand, um, how we can best ensure that families are actually going and, and we, we know and, and they're finding out about it, um, and also to hear from the families themselves. Right? Some people had said to me at the museum on Sunday, could it be a different day of the week because the MBTA schedule is very different and much more limited on Sunday, and so to wait for the train, we had to hit it exactly right, et cetera. So, you know, there's a lot of factors. How many weekends or how many days per month is it free? Who does this apply to? How many family members can join the student for free? So there's a lot that we are going to look at, and we'll be very happy to share all that data. So you don't probably. know about possible expansion yet until you look at the it data It is very much my hope that we can okay. expand. My sense is that we'll need to find some okay. more funding for that to happen, and that, that will be something that we have to plan out. You know, Mary, well, before we get to Mark and Dorchester, I just wonder, as long as you're talking about kids in school in Boston, do you think kids in school in Boston should be able to have cell phones? We talked about this earlier with our callers, saying that more and more school states are saying no more cell phones because kids aren't learning. And your kids might be too young for cell phones, but maybe not. Your kids have They're cell phones? They're never going to have cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do they really not? What are they, 7 and 10? Uh, 6 and 9. 6 and 9. I don't know. We're sort of eyeing teenage years as maybe yeah. one... Uh, point where, although some families have shared they have some of their young people who are younger, they might, there's now technology where you can have something on your wrist yes. where all it does is take a call from the, the families or mm -hmm. whatever's programmed in. From the or mayor, or I think. Is <laughs> yeah. really but but do you have an opinion about cell phones in schools? You know, I need to hear more from our Boston educators, but yeah. from what I've read and heard in other communities and kind of just in the news generally, it does seem to make sense that I, I know as a parent, I'm incredibly distracted when I have my phone I at know. home just trying to do things that I want to do and spend time with my kids and, and this and that. It just it changes the dynamic. And so I think in places where it can work, um, it anything to kind of simplify the 
um, experience of being a student in a very <laughs> stressful time, especially you know in the adolescent and uh, teenage years. I think I think all the best, all the better for learning and all that. Now you know, are there real um, concerns around how our young people are having to deal with adult issues very early on now, especially in um, a, a district like Boston and urban districts? We know that they are taking on a lot of family responsibilities too, but I, don't, I would hope that we could have a situation where maybe, you know, things kind of stay tucked away during yeah. learning time okay. and, and, you know, get Is your nine-year-old mad at you and your husband? So actually we are on a no video game, um, wow. no phone thing, but uh, it doesn't mean, somehow they still know how to get into my phone <laughs> and use my, f every time I look at my pictures, there's new little documentaries they've made. Yeah, and your kid photos. called me the other day, I forgot to tell <laughs> yeah. you. Mark in Dorchester, you're on Boston Public Radio with the mayor, Michelle Wu. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Jim. Hi, Marjorie. Long time Hi. listener. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, Mayor Wu. Good afternoon. Um, I have a question for you, which is, um, I live in a very nice neighborhood in Dorchester, and many of the two and three family homes have been sold to uh, corporations or absentee landlords. And uh, I'm seeing the, uh, the, uh, the lack of maintenance on these properties. Oftentimes, the yards are filled with trash and rubbish. And um, I love the 311 system. But my question is this. Uh, we have many repeat offenders, and um, the landlords are not doing anything about it. And what we find is the second and third um, uh, fines are only $25. And, you know, the, of course, the rental income is now for a, a three family approaching eighty to 100000 a year. And, that, you know, a $25 fine is not really providing any incentive for a landlord to clean up their act. So what's your question, um, Mark, for you the mayor? Know, oh, here he comes. Go ahead. My my, my question is, um, is there a way to increase the fine structure so absentee landlords or any landlord pays attention to the, and corrects the problem? We got it, Mark. Thank you much for your call. We appreciate it. Yes, um, there is a way to do so, and it is – okay, so I won't try to go through all the complications, but usually there um, – through state law, there are some caps that are set – and then cities can kind of decide within that range how high they want to go up to. And so this applies to, for example, fines for not shoveling snow um, on your property or this kind of uh, kind of clean it or, or, or get a ticket um, situation or, or other property related costs. Um, in the past, I know the city council has upped those fines in different categories precisely for this case where it just the incentives don't make sense. Um, and so we'd have to do a double check of where we are with relative to the state threshold, but it sounds like it's well below that and um, certainly something that we could explore um, and, and make sure we're changing the uh, numbers for the right incentives, but also then not to create undue burdens on our own existing uh, residents and uh, owner-occupied properties as well. Mark, thanks. We have to take a break. Before we do, you always bring us something to oh, right. celebrate a local business or enterprise. What's today? Okay, this today is City of Boston swag oh, again. Swim it's safe. Oh, Swim Safe. Um, oh, we want to talk yeah, about that. Good, thank you. A bag and towel from our oh, official City Swim program. Thank you. Which has just thank kicked you. off. We Tell will, us about Swim Safe. So um, there are free swim lessons for every generation within the family. It's part of our commitment that every child growing up in Boston should know how to swim, know how to ride a bike, be involved in the arts, sports, and get their hands dirty in the dirt. And that's a family affair. Um, this year we will have... 12 pools and the beach at uh, behind the Curly Community Center oh, open great. compared to just seven pools last summer. So we're steadily making progress on all the renovations and again, digging out from lots of years of um, needing to fix facilities, but check it out. And um, as Boston gets hotter over the summer, our pools are more and more important as well. And I'm really grateful to our um, human services cabinet and BCYF, the uh, Boston Children Youth and Centers for Youth and Families for focusing on swimming as a really important part of how we contribute. Okay, so you always bring us stuff. We never bring you anything. We still didn't bring you anything, but <laughs> indirectly, <laughs> Tracy Chang re from Pago, we're re-gifting, yeah. exactly. Yes. This is, I think, for your children. I don't know if they're allowed to eat sweets either, but we're gonna give it to you. <laughs> it's fabulous cheesecake from Pago. 
with some kind of berries on it. And we're going to give you a baklava from Jody Adams wow. Saloniki and tell your kids it's from two wonderful <laughs> chefs. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's Our pleasure. the voice of Michelle Wu, the mayor of the city of Boston. She's going to be with us till the top of the hour, taking a quick break, though. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH, broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library and streaming at facebook.com slash gbhnews and youtube.com slash gbhnews. Get ready for Books and Brews, a night of pints and conversation with best-selling author Hank Phillippe Ryan. Join GBH at Widowmaker Tap Room and Kitchen in Brighton, where Ryan will discuss her latest thriller, One Wrong Word. Bring your burning questions, for there'll be a chance to chat in person with the author. It's all happening on Tuesday, March 19th at 7 p.m. Tickets are free, but registration is required. Learn more and reserve your tickets now at gbh.org events. Our programs are made possible thanks to you and Trinity Rep, celebrating 60 years with August Wilson's Fences, a Pulitzer Prize-winning drama returning to Trinity Rep's stage March 21st through April 28th. Tickets and more at trinityrep.com. And Mass General Brigham Health Plan. Innovative plans, coverage, and a broad network of doctors. Mass General Brigham Health Plan, with you every day. For more information, you can visit massgeneralbrighamhealthplan.org. Welcome back to Boston Public uh, Radio. We're live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com and facebook.com slash GBH News. And we're for the rest of the hour. We're continuing with Ask the Mayor with Michelle Wu. You can call her, no, it's one open line, 877-301-8970, or text her, or do like William has done, to come at the library at the Boston Public Library. William, welcome to the show. Thank you. This is not the circumstances under which I wanted to meet with you. I am 77, an Asian American. I live on food stamps in East Boston. Thus, I am socially vulnerable to scams. I was scammed out of $2,000 from my brand new Rockland Trust account. The bank was unsympathetic, saying, because I had taken the money out to buy gift cards. I got a call in the morning from Geek Squad saying I had purchased two years of uh, service. They said, if this is in error, please call this number. I did, and that started the day where he not only had me take the $2,000 out, but charged my credit card of uh, $3,500 uh, at uh, Target charged to um, American Express. And you want to know, William, if there's something the mayor could do or recommend that could be done to help you. Is that where you I are? I sure would like to bring a lot of heat on well, the Well, let's hear if the, the mayor can help. William, we really appreciate your asking your uh, question. Thank you for coming. Um, I am so sorry to hear about that, but very glad to meet you, and um, I'll chat with you a little bit afterwards. I, I would love to get your information so that we can follow up some of uh, that. Some of this sounds like maybe some consumer protection um, steps that can involve other levels of government, but we can get you connected into them and um, do our best to connect you to where you where the services that you need to help. So with. don't leave. Stick around. The mayor is going to talk to you. Thank you, William. We really appreciate it. Mayor Wu, we've got someone, on Stephen from Jamaica Plan, that wants to talk about uh, the White Stadium proposal. We have several texts about that, too. So tell people what is going on with White Stadium uh, in the Franklin Park. Sure. Does Stephen have a specific question well, on Steve, there? Oh, I, Why don't we sorry. take him and yeah, then let should, her expand? We should expand. take Stephen. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's the way to do it. Go JP. ahead, Stephen. Hi, Stephen. Hi. Um, thanks for taking my call, Mayor. Um, I'm a big supporter of this, of the proposed White Stadium renovations. Um, but my question is that uh, the parking impacts for non-soccer events. Um, we've looked through the proposal from uh, the city, and we see that for soccer events, there are four satellite areas where people can um, go to and then shuttle into a game. But my question is, what about big events at that renovated site for non-soccer events? Great question. Um, 
So I will say that um, we are making really good progress and um, to, in order to get final approvals for the development and renovation of this project, we need to have a finalized transportation and parking plan with it. So that will, that's part of the requirement to um, kind of officially start construction. We are going to host, uh, I believe the team and the city are working on um, several workshops in the month of April with neighbors like yourself to go through all the details. So nothing is finalized at this point. The, I think the plan is to have some satellite locations just because there's not much parking within the park and we're not going to pave over um, the beautiful uh, Frederick Law Olmsted green space. Um, but I will note that Franklin Park regularly does host very, very large events, some much larger than the um, maximum audience of the soccer game. BAMS Fest, for example, and some other events on the place said regularly get 20,000 people and um, they currently don't have a transportation or parking plan whatsoever. So our hope is that actually working this out for the soccer team and applicable, as you said, for the times when there will be other events within the stadium, but also when there are events, uh, not necessarily in the stadium, but in the park in general, that this will be a, a major asset and value add of this partnership as well. So we probably needed to do something like this for some time, and this is a catalyst for us to do it, um, but we are wading through the various routes that shuttles might take and when and how. Um, for the games in particular, you know, the, the very conservative maximal estimate is 20, 20 games a season, kind of between the March and, you know, September, October timeframe. Um, currently, every National Women's Soccer League team plays 13 home games. So it's far short of the 20. They're adding a few teams, but we're not actually sure if it'll still be that every team plays every team. So it'll be somewhere in the probably 13 to 15 um, home games a, a season, something like one or two um, home games per month. So it's, it's, it's going to be pretty spread out. Um, and that does mean that there's lots of opportunity for other major events, whether it's the BPS graduations that already happened there, um, home football games at the end of the season, home soccer games for any number of our BPS student uh, teams, other events that the community wants to see. This will be open for public use and we want to get as much of that in as possible and that will require having a, a strong circulation and uh, traffic management plan. Stephen, thanks. Know, as a follow-up text on this from Anna Jamaica Plain, just to preface, um, there has been some blowback about the White Stadium plan because, of, as you say, the football teams will not be able to play there till the end of Soccer. the season. Well, no, that's... Oh, the high school yes. football yes. teams, oh, yeah, will not be yes. able to be there till the end of the season. I'm so upset about that. Uh, and this person, Anna from Jamaica Plain, wants to know if it doesn't work out, the soccer team has already committed $30 million, the city has committed $50 million. If it doesn't work out with the soccer team, will the city pull its $50 million investment, uh, just even though, as you pointed out, Ms., uh, Madam Mayor, that the uh, stadium needs significant renovation? Yeah, okay, let me talk about both pieces because I think they're both important. Um, on football, first, there are seven varsity football teams um, across the entire BPS district. Two of them use Franklin Park or use White Stadium as their home venue for their games, Boston Latin School and Boston Latin Academy. Uh, they each have five home games that they play in the stadium. Their practices, they actually don't play at all in the stadium right now. One team plays at a different field for their practices. The other team uses the playstead, which is outside of um, the stadium, but in Franklin Park, which will still be available. Um, and so we're talking about um, five games for each of the teams that are what's potentially going to need to find a different home. Um, and that, and that, that's it. And I don't even think it will be five because we will, uh, this, the football season usually extends longer than the soccer season. So we'll be able to accommodate hopefully some of those with the scheduling of the team towards the end of the uh, calendar year. And then after those games, the citywide championships and those kind of large final games, we'll be able to get all the teams in to play some of the, those end of season games there. So in fact, football usage of the stadium should actually increase with this as well. Uh, in addition, and especially with the increase to soccer and track and again, larger um, community events. Uh, and, and for the, these two football teams, even during construction, when there will be a little bit of disruption for their home games and for their practices, 
the city is investing in two other fields so that they will have brand new scoreboards, uh, fields, and um, the, the larger investment that is being made possible in youth sports, including football here, is actually a net positive here and, and not uh, taking anything away. On the um, $50 million side, <laughs> we think this is, um, you know, the, our budgets for construction projects keep going up and up and up as time goes by. Uh, that is the commitment that we're able to make from the capital budget right now to do half of a stadium with the team uh, building the other half and fixing up the field and maintaining it in perpetuity. There are two considerations here. One is that, again, this is part of, this is a BPS facility. So with a hundred other buildings that are in much need of investment, we won't be able to prioritize. Without the partnership to make the whole stadium possible, we're not going to be able to prioritize making half the stadium's renovations in there instead of doing over a, another school that badly needs it. So. In some ways it is that if this doesn't happen to the kind of potential and standard that we believe our student athletes deserve, then those dollars will be best used elsewhere within the BPS footprint. There's many, many uses. The other important part about this partnership is that the soccer team will end up, again, playing those 13, 15 games, having some of their practices. That will represent less than 10% of the total usage of the stadium. The usage for BPS is going to more than triple in terms of the number of hours. Sometimes there's this belief that it's busy all the time and now the soccer team will be using it instead of our students, but the reality is that most of the time when you go by there, the stadium is chained and locked up. It's not used that often and football, soccer, they've all been used track, have been using it less and less and less frequently because the facilities don't even meet state competition standards anymore. They're in that bad of shape. And so we need to not only fix it up, but for once, unlike decades before, have the resources to maintain it annually. And the partnership also includes lease uh, revenues, profit sharing, so that we will have resources to build up Franklin Park and fulfill elements of the action plan in addition to maintaining the stadium and having a, a sustainable plan unlike the city's, you know, unlike how we've ever had it before. Very, very, very quickly. These are the real world considerations. Obviously we've discussed with you the uh, Emerald Necklace Conservancy first lawsuit they filed, filed against the city. One of the contentions they make is a legal one, that there's an illegal conversion of public land for private use. Uh, uh, obviously you disagree, I assume. So you're nodding in agreement. Are you, nego is there any negotiations going on between the city I mean, and the, the plaintiffs, or we had um, I met with the board members, had had conversations, and then um, did not even hear that they had filed a lawsuit until the Boston Globe columnist reached out to tell us okay. that they had seen it first. And so we are in court now. We had a hearing last week before the judge. We hope uh, there's some deadlines this week for more responsive documents from both sides. And they're seeking an injunction to hold to. To stop the stay any demolition, yep, um, yeah. and we hope that okay. there will be at least a first reaction later uh, this month, or maybe even the week after that. Um, I think you know, in terms of the legal argument, this this is a complex deal uh, and proposal. No other city in the country has a professional sports team that is going to be located in a stadium owned by a public school district. To have not only a team not be taking away public facilities, but actually investing in them is remarkable. And um, the, the terms of this lease of White Stadium, of the underlying trust fund, there are lots of examples where even Frederick Law Olmsted, when he designed the park, envisioned private entities providing refreshment, drawing people in, and getting more people to fall in love with the park through having events to go to. You know, uh, we talk, used to talk to you every month about the situation in Mass and Cass. Obviously, it's been clear. Tori Bedford, our colleague, did a story about how a lot of the nonprofit groups that provide support to those who spent most of their lives at Mass and Cass have had an impossible time uh, locating a lot of these people to provide the support they need to not only live decent lives, but to have hope and stay, stay alive. How are you addressing that concern? We have a very, um, I mean, just it's, there's nowhere else that has such a um, tight knit and strong ecosystem of provider organizations working with city and state agencies to serve community members. And uh, Boston really is the national standard when it comes to addressing homelessness and um, tying in and making sure that we're looking holistically at substance use and mental health along, alongside that. Uh, we continue to be in uh, coalition with those groups around next steps. Uh, we have not 
I don't, by any means said that we're done with Mass and Cass and, and turning the page. But have um, you lost touch with a significant number? Are you able to track and identify so you can continue to provide support? So um, the residents of the former encampments at Mass and Cass, the 200 some people and those who have um, been working with the city, we are, there's, there's many, many ways to stay in touch and, and track and um, continue providing services. And in fact, on the, in the November kind of mobilization effort when everyone was connected to housing and shelter, there was a list of residents who we were not able, who did not end up showing up at their assigned um, and, and agreed upon locations that they, they wanted to move into. And the team has been diligently in the months since then tracking down and finding, we were down to the last five people. Um, and even so, we believe some of them may have connect, reconnected with family. The reality is that it was a very free-flowing situation. There were lots of people coming in from outside Boston and certainly, and even outside Massachusetts. And so some of this has been um, family reunification efforts. Some of this has been helping everyone understand and connect to the resources available in the kind of spectrum of treatment into permanent housing. And there have been hundreds of um, community members who have now been able to access that permanent mm -hmm. housing through this. I will say there's a, um, you know, we are experiencing some connection also with strain on our shelter system with the migrant um, crisis and families, newly arrived migrant families. Yeah. At this point, you know, a couple weeks ago, we were at 25% of our um, beds within our city shelter system. That's not to serve the family shelters that the state is responsible for, but just individuals who are not connected to a family unit. 25% of those shelter beds that had been more of the uh, places where we were serving folks from Mass and Cass, 25% were um, mi newly arrived migrant individuals, and now we're at over a third of those beds are um, uh, migrant residents. And so we are starting to see multiple needs all layered on top of the underlying housing crisis. And um, so we're trying to make sure people get the support to exit shelter mm -hmm. as quickly as possible, to be able to have permanent housing, uh, but it is all, on, all hands on deck at this point. Well, you talked before about how Roxbury seems to be getting more than its fair share of the burden for housing migrants, that people are not going to Brookline or Wellesley or Newton, and that's still continuing, I guess. We have a minute. Oh, sorry. No, 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 it's fine. I'm just telling the mayor. Yeah. Well, um, we have the, the other overflow shelter now um, in the Seaport area is um, up and running very smoothly, and um, we all have a part to play in this. This is not an issue that is going to be resolved without a lot of coordination yeah. from a lot of entities at all levels of government, and so I'm really grateful to the governor and her team for working so closely with us on the many facets and, and all the ways that it's impacting our residents' daily lives, too. So before you go, uh, you love talking about zoning. I love talking about cigarettes, <laughs> I, and I do. So Brookline just had their, I don't know if it's called their regulation, their ordinance, approved by the S uh, state's highest court, basically a lifetime ban. Uh, I would have thought in violation of the state's 21-year-old rule, but essentially if you're born after January 1st of the year 2000, you can't sell cigarettes in- Buy. Buy, my apologies, buy cigarettes in Brookline. What do you think of that approach to the public health issue of That's cigarette right. smoking? You could be 80 and not be able That's to buy right. cigarettes. That's right. What do you think, Mayor Wu? <laughs> yeah, um, a number of years ago, Boston had implemented a ban on flavored cigarettes mm -hmm. and um, flavored tobacco as a way to try to weave within what were the existing legal parameters. And we heard a lot that actually that was unfair because there are certain um, stores that then had a preference. Mm. So this, this can even the playing field in the name of public health. I think it's something that we all should be looking into. Excellent. Mayor good Ruth, to see thank you. Thank you very, very much nice for coming you in. Um, are you a good swimmer? Speaking of swim safe, are you a good swimmer? I hopped into the pool when, you, when we cut the ribbon in East Boston. I'm sure I'll be doing it again this <laughs> summer. I love that. It's great. I understand she does a mean dog paddle. I bet, <laughs> I no, I would bet she's a little better than that, actually. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Mayor